Oh boy, motherboard time. This is the X670E Tai Chi from ASRock. This is their flagship motherboard. Flagship motherboard means that it's the launch motherboard. This is the one that AMD did all the testing with, with ASRock. Let's unbox it and take a deeper look. Look at that. It looks so fancy. So fancy. So fancy. Well, it weighs 17 pounds. All right, what do we got in our accessory bundle? We have the Tai Chi postcard, a quick installation guide for the AM5 socket because it is new and you're gonna struggle a little bit with all things that are new. We've got our Tai Chi manual. We've got our M.2 screws. Got a really substantial Wi-Fi antenna. This is for our Wi-Fi 6E solution. Cable ties. This heat sink is for a PCI Express 5 M.2, active cooling, that's substantial. We also have, let's see, SATA cables, four of those, plus also a USB 2.0 breakout header. So this gives you an additional two USB 2.0 headers that you can locate at the rear of your case or whatever for additional USB peripherals. And then a whole bunch of M.2 screws. All right, if we take a look at our board layout, you'll notice that you've only got two PCI Express expansion slots. And they are both PCI Express 5.0 to the CPU. X16 or X8, X8 are your options for operating this. So if you have a higher end PCI Express peripheral and you don't want it to use lanes from your GPU, um, I wanna look at some of the other boards that ASRock has because you've got other options. If you are going to run two high performance devices, this is pretty good because you get you know a by eight by eight configuration in a PCI Express 5.0 format. Also notice the sticker. This is a pretty standard feature on ASRock motherboards to explain to you DDR5 and how the memory controller on AM4 and DDR5 need a kind of a long initial handshake. So if you put 128 gigabytes of memory in this platform with four DIMMs, you know, you're looking at four to five minutes potentially for it to handshake and deal with DDR5. Now, AMD has Expo compatible memory, and I don't have a huge sample size here. I only have two kits of Expo memory. Uh, it seems like the Expo memory boots faster than the non-Expo memory. Maybe it's reading the Expo configuration to get a hint on how it should work. XMP profiles, I mean, you can load an XMP profile. That option is supported in the, in the, the ASRock Tai Chi BIOS. But, you know, the JEDEC specifications for DDR5, even just sort of pathfinding to get that initial boot up, it can take a little while. Now, once your motherboard and your memory get to know one another, it's not a freshly installed kit of memory, that five minute boot time is completely out the window. It's, you know, the normal like three seconds, two, three, four, five seconds, something like that. It's only for the initial configuration when you first put the system together that the motherboard has to detect and train on the memory. It has to learn the electrical characteristics of the whole setup, basically. That's just something to keep in mind because if you're building your first system and you turn it on and it just sits there and doesn't do anything for two minutes, you're probably gonna freak out because historically that was bad news. But on AM5, not necessarily. This motherboard has a built-in rear I.O. shield, and there is a fan, a VRM fan, in the VRM area because AM5, oh boy, 230 watts maximum socket power, and we're gonna be rocking a 12-core CPU on this platform that's gonna consume up to, well, it's TDP's 170 watts from AMD, and it will use the power. It will get warm and toasty. 40, 45 degrees C nominal, just at idle, is not atypical on AM5. In terms of board layout, at the top edge of the board, we have two eight pin power connectors, three four pin CPU header, fan header things for whatever you wanna use as far as cooling goes. We have two RGB LED headers. They are both the uh, sort of modern V2 digital RGB headers. So there's no analog 5050 header there. We have another four pin fan header as well as our 24 pin ATX power connector, 30 pin front panel USB you know, 3.2 type connection, USB type C connection, eight six gigabit per second SATA ports. Our front panel connection, a hardware 
power and reset LED, our diagnostic readout LEDs, another 30 pin USB connector, two USB 2.0 headers, a 50-50 header at the bottom in white, and another digital RGB header. So that's a total of three digital RGB headers, another four pin fan header, front panel audio, and optical SPDIF header. The motherboard is trimmed in this sort of tasteful, you know, coppery-ish, gold-ish, Tai Chi trim. It says the philosophy of infinite potential. Sounds good to me. I can see that there's a heat pipe connecting the two large blocks of aluminum uh, that are connecting the VRMs. I can also see that there are thermal pads connecting with the MOSFETs as well as the chokes on both sides. Yes, on both sides of the connection here. This is a substantial amount of uh, connectivity. There's also a back plate on this motherboard, which is nice for physical reinforcement, but it's also thermally connected to the motherboard. So that'll help draw some heat away from the reverse side of the PCB here. It's a nice touch. And we can see our, you know, slightly different, but slightly the same AM5 mounting bracket. Now, if you're out of the loop, AM5 is backward compatible with AM4. What that means is that if you have an AM4 cooler in 99.9% .9 of cases, it will physically fit on this AM5 motherboard. AM5 is backward compatible with AM4. That doesn't necessarily mean that AM4 cooler was designed to deal with the increased power consumption of AM5. AMD sort of saw what's going on in the desktop CPU space and said, okay, well, if you ramp up the wattage, we'll also ramp up the wattage. And so now we have, you know, CPUs that can consume up to 170 watts. But that's not the whole story. There's some really interesting stuff that I've taken a look at in my overclocking videos and even underclocking. You can run the 16 core AM5 CPU at less than 65 watts TDP and match the performance of the 5950X. So a 5950X with fans screaming is twice the power of our 16 core 7950X if you wanna run it that way. It's you, the power is in your hands. You can choose how much power to dump into your CPU Limited only by your motherboard, and this motherboard, not gonna be the limitation. Now the x 670 chipset is a fanless chipset. It is optionally a dual chipset solution, meaning that one chipset connects to another chipset and they daisy chain together. I've actually done some other videos about that. You can read more about the x 670 chipset in general, but that also means that we've got a ton of M.2 connectivity here. I can tell you in general terms that AMD is going for USB connectivity with AM5 more than PCI Express. I mean, you probably figured that out looking at the motherboard. We've only got two PCI Express 5 slots. So there's not, I mean, it's got all these PCIe lanes. They're not going to slots. Where are they going? M.2, USB, and USB 4, 40 gigabit. Let's take a look at the rear I.O. So at the rear I.O. here, we have a BIOS flashback button and a clear CMOS button. I'll talk more about those in just a second. We've also got our Wi-Fi 6E solution, an HDMI out, a 2.5 gigabit LAN, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A, those are the, the yellow ports here. We've got our audio solution. Things are sort of changing in the audio world. This is line out and microphone in and optical SPDIF. There's not two sets of connections here. The old school analog 7.1, it's not there, but this is a 7.1 audio solution. We've got USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A and USB 4 Type C and another USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A and another Type C. Then we've got a stack of four USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A. Those are five gigabit ports. And it's basically five or 10 gigabit, depending on what you want. Now the USB 4, of course, is 40 gigabit, so you got a lot of options there. Now those front USB connections that I was mentioning before, well, they're also really high end. The front USB 3.2 is a Gen 2 by 2, that's 20 gigabit. We also have seven USB 3.2 Gen 1, and the four 30 pin headers are of course five gigabit USB. So you can have four type A ports at the front plus the type C, which is 20 gigabit. So 40 gigabits of USB at the front panel. And the way that it's arranged on the motherboard with this chipset, there's much less bottlenecking and USB resource contention than past generations. That's a, another thing that I probably need to do a video and an explainer on. Because when you look at some of the older motherboards, especially like the X470 motherboards that had a ton of USB connectivity, a lot of the time the motherboard maker would just put a USB hub on the motherboard. And so that doesn't really give you more USB bandwidth, it just shares more bandwidth among devices. And that was fine a couple of years ago. We didn't have a ton of high speed peripherals, but you know, now everybody's doing streaming and video capture and a ton of peripherals and this is you know it does chew up a fair bit of bandwidth so it's nice having those sort of direct paths all the way back to the cpu 
The thing to keep in mind with X70 is that you actually do have a lot more connectivity. In addition to just PCI Express 5, you've got another four lanes. So we get 28 lanes total. Four of those lanes are configured as PCI Express 4.0 to our X670 chipset. And then you've got two 5.0 lanes on this motherboard to M.2. And then you get 16 lanes for your PCIe storage, which can be 16 by zero or by eight by eight. It's pretty impressive stuff. While we're talking about USB 4, because AM5, at least the four CPUs that are launching with the platform, uh, have integrated graphics, yeah, there's built-in RDNA 2 in every single CPU, you will be able to use the USB-C outputs here if you so choose with video. So you can use a USB-C to DisplayPort cable and then be able to run a you know, DisplayPort display off of the built-in iGPU on your RDNA graphics card. You also have HDMI out, so you can use that as well. That's totally fine. It's going to work and, and be totally okay. You can also use it in addition to a discrete GPU. So if you add in a GPU, you can keep the iGPU enabled and have both, or you can disable the iGPU, mm, whichever way you want to do it. Now our 2.5 gigabit LAN here is the killer 2.5 gigabit LAN. <laughs> Pretty cool, I know, it's you know it's a gaming LAN, it's Intel, I mean. <laughs> killer E3100G. So not bad, 2.5 gig. I would have maybe liked to have seen a second 2.5 gig NIC, especially on the Tai Chi flagship board, but hey. Uh, I will admit that not a lot of people are rocking dual LAN at home. Now the, the rest of the PCIe layout on this motherboard is pretty interesting. When I'm talking about the PCIe interfaces and PCI Express 5 and blah, 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 different motherboard makers may or may not choose to implement it that, that way. So this motherboard has a single PCI Express 5 M.2. The other four direct to CPU PCIe lanes seem to have been routed to the USB 4 controller on the motherboard. That's actually pretty genius, I like that. Of course, that means that the chipset is gonna be responsible for your other M.2, those are the Hyper M.2, those are PCI Express 4.0. If you're gonna rock a lot of PCI Express 4.0 M.2 SSDs, it will bottleneck through the chipset because the chipset itself is also only PCI Express 4.0. It's just fine for game storage, but I wouldn't recommend it for RAID or anything like that. So this is a single M.2 for PCI Express 5, which again, you know, PCI Express 5 for storage, I'm kinda of on the fence because you know, Samsung has the 990 now, which is going to be best in class in terms of your I.O. latency, but it's only a PCI Express 4.0 device. It's going to top out at like seven and a half, eight gigabytes per second. The initial, like the launch day PCI Express 5 SSDs can already do 10, 12, 14 gigabytes per second in terms of raw transfer rate. But the I.O. latency is going to be a little bit worse than that Samsung 990 because Samsung's put a lot of work into that. So it's just a little bit of a give and trade depending on what you want. Do you want raw throughput or do you want low latency? The thing that makes your computer feel snappier is generally latency related more than uh, I.O. related. So something to keep in mind as you're building the system. I don't see that as a limitation on this motherboard to be clear that it doesn't have two uh, you know, PCI Express 5 M.2. I would rather see those lanes broken out into PCIe slots as we have with the ASRock Steel Legend. Of course, that is only PCI Express 3.0 because it's the bottom edge of the motherboard, but you know they save on cost for having to have re-drivers or anything like that to get PCI Express 4 or 5 out of those lanes. PCI Express 3 will work at the bottom edge of the motherboard with nothing extra, nothing else special needed. In this case, they're using those PCIe lanes for direct attached peripherals to the CPU, which is fine. I have no problem with that. I think that actually is a good solution for most consumers. So to recap, this motherboard has a total of four M.2, one over here in front of the RAM, that's gonna be pretty good for cooling, but that is only PCI Express 4.0 through the chipset. Your blazing M.2, which is the PCI Express 5.0, just above the graphics card, which is the one that I would recommend that you use with this giant honking M.2 heatsink. Goodness gracious me. You don't have to use that if having a tiny fan inside your computer is not your thing, but that's gonna handle whatever kind of heat the M.2 controller is gonna put out. Goodness gracious. Another thing that I love about this motherboard is that ASRock included a block diagram in their manual showing exactly how everything is connected so you know what goes where and you can sort of plan your system accordingly. And sure enough, that confirms that the USB 4 Maple Ridge controller Wait a minute, is it Maple Ridge Thunderbolt? Ah, uh, you can't call it Thunderbolt unless Intel certifies it, otherwise it's USB 4. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know there you go and that's about everything you need to know with regard to the tai chi and building a system around this motherboard i'm going to install this 12 core processor right now so that we can build a system because i am out of time 
Boom! Our CPU's mounted. All in all, not a bad board, no complaints. Motherboards are kind of expensive, especially for the flagship genre of X670E motherboards. ASRock has tried really hard to keep the costs down, but the features as high as possible on this board from what I can tell. I mean, that's why we don't have a 10 gigabit NIC. Most people aren't gonna benefit from that. That's why some of the choices in the design were made the way that they were. But the launch, you know, quote unquote flagship motherboards generally are a good idea. They seems to get more support over the lifetime of the socket. I, I talked a little bit more about that in the AM5 launch video. You can, you can check that out. So that's been a quick look at the X670E Tai Chi from ASRock. They've also got a, an even higher end, the Carrera, Car Carrara, Carrera, Carrera Marble. It's a marble edition. It's uh, very similar to this, but uh, it's got a little bit more of a marble aesthetic that's even more high end because that's what we do now. We do super high end motherboards. And if you don't want the highest end thing for AM5, well, I've got some good news. B650 is right around the corner. AMD has said October. That's just a blink away. So, you know, if you want something a little less expensive, maybe wait for B650, because you can still have PCI Express 5 on B650. Just depends on the board. Depends on how they put it together. I'm one of those level one. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. Let's build. I'll see you there. It's booting.